You know, I, I grew up in a house where my mom and my dad were both alcoholics, um, uh, both P Peruvian. It was a Latin, like a Latino home growing up. Um, and, you know, we lived in a predominantly black neighborhood outside of Washington, D.C. You know, the pastor, the preacher said what he said. My father backslid, went into drinking. Mm -hmm. And my sophomore year in high school, my parents got divorced. Um, and I, I just started to rebel, didn't do good in school, did you know, hung out with the wrong crowd, did the wrong things. But because I was getting depressed, I was having issues with anger. And I, you know, I was just like, you know what, God, you took away my dad. My mom's depressed. She used to be this amazing intercessor. You know, uh, my family's in shambles. They're cutting the water off. They're cutting the lights off. You know, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to indulge in having sex, getting high and drinking and getting drunk. And I'm going to do that with the intentions of hurting you. Like, that was my thing. I'm going to hurt you. Welcome to our podcast. I am thrilled to introduce our special guest, Pastor Chris Petrat. Pastor Chris is a remarkable man of a God with over 27 years in ministry. That's a lot of years. Um, he brings in a powerful, powerful testimony today that you don't want to miss. You don't want to miss a moment of this powerful, powerful story. So we want you to stick around. Um, and if you enjoy the content we're sharing, be sure to like, share, and subscribe to our channel so you never miss an episode. Pastor Chris, I want to welcome you to our podcast. We appreciate you, you for taking the time to be here. Um, how are you doing? I'm doing great. I'm just uh, overwhelmed that uh, you guys invited me to be a part of this. I'm, 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 I'm really humbled, but also honored. So thank you for the invite. Thank you very much. Well, Pastor Chris, you have, like I said, you have a powerful testimony that I can't wait to hear. Well, you went from being a broken kid with a broken family, but now witnessing re restoration within your own family. And the part yeah. that I love is that you're influencing other broken kids, offering yeah. them a way out, you know, which is, you yeah. know, which is very powerful. Well, can you walk us through where your story began and how, you know, how you got to where you are now? Yeah, I mean, you know, I, I grew up in a house where my mom and my dad were both alcoholics, um, uh, both P Peruvian. It was a Latin, like a Latino home growing up. Um, and you know, we lived in a predominantly black neighborhood outside of Washington, D.C., a place called Rockville, Maryland. And um, one of the other Latino families that moved in was also from Peru, which was really, wow, like, oh, this is crazy. So we became good friends with them. But after a year, they moved out and we didn't see them for a year. They came back on a Sunday morning and uh, the the wife the wife of uh, of my buddy uh, well the mother of my friend mm -hmm. and they they got born again they were actually they they got they accepted Jesus in their life and they were going to a uh, a spirit filled Baptist church so they you know we were young and basically they said hey come on come with me uh, my mother was hungover my father was you know so. <laughs> It was probably good for for me and my sister to be out the house anyway. So they started taking us to church, and um, every time we left church, you know, they you know in Sunday school they give you these little sheets uh, that you were working on that have the Bible story on or whatever. You know, back then in the eighties it was felt, you know. So we brought these things and we were telling my mom after three to four weeks she decided to come to church. Mm. She accepted Jesus and she, you know, she never drank again. And, um, so, and, and, and then at that time around the second grade, my Sunday school teacher led me to the Lord. Um, 
and it was um and it you know and we grew up in that um just the 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 freeness you know people speaking in tongues you know people falling out in the holy spirit you know <laughs> i remember the first time i saw my mom fall out in the holy spirit i got scared i didn't know what was going on but i grew up in a very free you know atmosphere and and um and uh and then we you know then we had a church split and we went to an american church uh, but my mom wanted my dad to get saved so that we were going to also a Pentecostal church, oh, a four square Pentecostal church. So my Sundays were my mom would drive me 45 minutes to the American church because they had they you know, she wanted me to go to church there. And um, and they had a youth group. And then she wanted then I'd have to after that go to Pentecostal church from like you know, two to six. <laughs> and then after six, she drive me back to the American church because they had youth group that night where they had games and stuff. And so my mom made a sacrifice and an investment into me mm. to make sure that we were connected to other young people our age at the same time that we were getting fed, you know, with people that we were comfortable getting fed with. Because Latino churches, uh, a lot of them don't have youth groups. And a lot of them actually don't really have a priority to make youth groups. Uh, so um, so that was my Sundays. Um, I, I would say things were going good. Um, finally, around seventh grade, my dad finally came around, dropped alcohol, and got invested into the Spanish church. Um, he, he, you know, for two years, we, our family was doing really good. Um, and then my father got, uh, hurt because one of, um, these preachers came in and he was just talking about how people that commit suicide go straight to hell. Oh. And, uh, I just remember my father staying after talking to the preacher and just crying with tears in his eyes, um, and I didn't know why. Years later, I found out that through a cousin of mine's that my grandfather, his dad, committed suicide. Mm. And there was a generational curse in our family because my great-grandfather committed suicide, my great-great-grandfather. And so there was a lot of mental illness and a lot of stuff. And so I guess, you know, my father hearing that, nobody wants to know that their father is in hell. <laughs> That's right. Especially when, when this whole time you think that, they're in they're in heaven, you know, um, and 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 there's more to that story because I don't really think my my grandfather committed suicide. I think there was a medical, he had, he had a medical meltdown. But you know that's nearly here or there. You know the pastor, the preacher said what he said. My father backslid, went into drinking, mm -hmm. and my sophomore year in high school, my parents got divorced, um, and I I just started to rebel. Didn't do good in school. Did you know? Hung out with the wrong crowd, did the wrong things, and I remember on the eve of you know I was about seventeen, eighteen. I remember on the eve of a party, you know. Now, now I'll say this: I was still a virgin, even though I came out of this neighborhood. I was really scared of sex. Part of that was because I did experience a molestation when I was. Uh, 10, 11 years old. And, and second is I also had a friend that died of AIDS, um, at 13, he heterosexual having heterosexual sex, you know, because AIDS in the nineties was looked at as a gay disease. Well, it wasn't, <laughs> it was a sexually transmitted disease. And so seeing those two things, I knew enough in my head that I was like one sexual encounter can kill you. But because I was getting depressed, I was having issues with anger, and I, you know, I was just like, you know what, God, you took away my dad. My mom's depressed. She used to be this amazing intercessor, you know. Uh, my family's in shambles. They're cutting the water off. They're cutting the lights off. You know, I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna indulge in having sex, getting high, and drinking, and getting drunk, and I'm gonna do that with the intentions of hurting you. Like that was my thing. I'm gonna hurt you, and. And um, on a, that Saturday, so that was a party that was, I was supposed to go to. A young lady was very much wanting to take my virginity away. Wow. Um, and, and that Saturday night, on the eve of that party, um, a Sunday school teacher from the fourth grade called me. Mm -hmm. And he called me and he said, Chris, there is a move of God happening at your church right now. There's a preacher that's coming all your youth group is being touched by the Holy Spirit. They're on fire for God. I've never seen this 
uh, on young people before, you have to come to church tomorrow. And I said, no. <laughs> I flat out just said, nope, because at that point, my heart was perverse. My heart wanted to pursue all the things. You know, I was depressed. I didn't think God would love me. Uh, I definitely didn't think that he would pour his spirit on me because I made those promises. Mm -hmm. You know, I want to hurt you the way you hurt me, you know. And for three hours, he tried to convince me. Finally, he said this. He goes, listen, after church, I'll take you anywhere you want to go eat. And I said, oh, okay, well, you should have started off that way. <laughs> we ain't got no food in the house. So I said, okay, all right, I'll go to church. I went to the church. As soon as I got in the parking lot, I felt something grip me. Wow. My stomach was turning. I was nervous. I, I didn't know what was going on. I was like, what's happening? I went in the hallway I ran into a guy that would become my brother in the Lord. And, and he's just like with tears in his eyes, like, Chris Petrot, you're here. We've been praying for you. Two weeks ago, we called you by name that God would bring you back. God's going to touch your life. He's going to use you. And I was like, what is going on? And I thought it was so weird. What do you mean you're calling my name? Well, I got weirded. And so I said, I'm going to go sit in the balcony. <laughs> now, I went as I turned the corner to go upstairs, these two girls who I wasn't friends with in the youth group. They were considered like the popular pretty girls, you know, right. they didn't, they never talked to me and they're looking at me with tears in their eyes. And they're like, Chris, we called you by name. You're here. God's going to touch you. He touched my heart. Blah, blah. And I'm and at that point, I'm like, okay, so, something's up. Right. I, I go upstairs, I go up to the balcony and I, and I really just, the message was just for me. And I was stubborn you know, to, to go up and get prayer. But finally, after the last call, uh, the Lord just quickened my heart and I jumped up and I ran up and I went down, down to the altar and I had a, a ex hell's angel hmm. pray for me. Wow. And I remember feeling like, like I felt like the presence of God, I started to cry instantly. I haven't cried. I cried for eight hours that day. Cause I, I, I held all this childhood pain hmm. in and, um, and, um, and then I started to sway back and forth, you know, like I could feel the power of the Holy spirit. And I thought this guy was pushing me. Well, when I opened my eyes, there's no one in front of me. He's three people down. Wow. And at that time I said, Oh, this is real. God, you're going to touch me. And I closed my eyes. I flew like I say six feet. I don't know how. <laughs> how far I flew, but I knocked a whole bunch of chairs and um, I felt cold water hit the top of my head and go back and forth in my body to my feet. And it was just cleaning me out. And I heard the audible voice of the Lord. And he says, what do you want, sons? The first time I ever heard the voice of the Lord. And I said, I want all my street friends to come to know you, Jesus. And I want my mom and dad back together. And 10 years from getting up from that, um, all my street friends, we led them to the Lord. And then, like I said, uh, you know, my parents uh, almost, what, 12 years ago were divorced for, so, you know, 18. You know, they I walked my mother down the aisle and she remarried my dad. And um, and and that was the beginning of, of me going after the Lord. Those days uh, we were praying. We were only me and my, my buddy, Michael. Um, and my wife and her best friend, uh, Sandy, we were just friends and we would fast every Thursday for revival. We need an outpouring God. And, and, you know, we did it. I don't know how long we did it. It seemed like eight years, just fasted and prayed at 7 p.m. at the back of the church till 1130. And we were just crying out. We were so desperate for for God to do what actually we see God doing right now. And so. Mm. That's kind of that's kind of the testimony. Um, you know, I was born with a learning disability. I was ADHD, mm. dyslexic. I had dysgraphia. Um, a prophet told me that I was going to be a, a, a voice to a generation, and so I didn't know what that meant. <laughs> and 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 I wanted to go to Bible college, and I had two times I wanted to go to two different Bible colleges. And my mentors, my spiritual fathers at the time, both very educated men. Um, both felt like the Holy Spirit said, no, Holy Spirit wants to be your teacher. 
And I remember being sad because I was like, man, how am I going to be a voice if I don't have a Bible college degree, <laughs> you know? But God uses, you, you know, and that's how God has used me, um, quite honestly. I, 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 I have the gift of faith and I believe that, that he's going to turn things around. But in these years, it's been amazing. We have seen uh, the worst of worst of society had to offer and we have seen God's love change them and, 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 and missed it. It's almost like the cave of Amdullah with King da with David, right? He had to actually, he had to pastor uh, a bunch of misfits, but at the end, when he became King, they became his mighty men, that's you true. know? And, and I think right there, that's, that's, that's kind of what I would say. I, I really experienced seeing that. Woo! Pastor Chris, you know, we got time, right? Yes. <laughs> You know what? Um, you talked about that powerful experience that you had. Um, and I do remember from your testimony that at the age of 12, you had a similar encounter, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. and, you know, can you talk a little bit about it? Yeah. So like I told you, my parents went to a Pentecostal Foursquare church. Well, the Foursquare denomination had these regional camps. So if you were in the East Coast, there was a campground in Ohio that all in the summertime, all the youth from the Foursquare Church would go to. And so um, I remember our pastor saying, hey, Chris, we really feel like you, you need to go. And I didn't want to go because I've never been outside of Maryland. And um, well, I've been to Virginia and D.C., but I've never really been outside the DMV, D.C., Maryland, Virginia. And, um, and I, and he told me the cost was $50. I was like, Oh, I'm not going. My parents, my mom don't got money for that. And then the following week he goes, you know, my mom, my mom wanted me to go and she sold her engagement ring. She pawned her engagement oh, wow. ring. And, um, and so I knew that the pastor was going to be uh, uh, frustrated if I told him that my mom did that. So I went and told my, Hey pastor, my mom, she totally just gave her engagement ring. And so he went to the pawn shop and bought it back and said, no, have faith. Someone's going to sow a seed. And sure enough, the following Sunday, a man sowed us a hundred dollars for me to go on this trip, which meant I had $50 of spending money. <laughs> I've never had that much. Uh, that meant like going to McDonald's and, and eating a meal. I've never, I never experienced like being able to buy my own meal. So it was like a first for a lot of things. But when we got there now, here's the thing. We're a Latino, predominantly Latino church. And the camp is about 300 white kids. Mm. So we're going into the woods of Ohio. I've been in the car for the first time in my life for nine hours, eight or nine hours. And I'm like, Lord, I can't do this. What, I, what is going on? This is the weirdest thing. Then we go in the woods and I don't like the woods because I don't hang out in the woods, you know. And then we go to this campground where we pull in and there's like these 300 white young people youth were, you know, playing sports or whatever. And when we get out of the van, it's evident that we're like different. <laughs> but you know, what was really crazy was they all came and greeted them and they wanted to be our friends because we were so different. And, and so everybody, you know, so I instantly met some farm kid from, a, you know, I want to say the Midwest somewhere. And, um, it was time for worship. So we had to climb up a hill to go to the tabernacle for, for praise and worship for our first night session at camp. And I remember going up the hill and being upset because I was sweating and I was like, I don't like hiking. I'm, you know, I'm complaining. I've never been outside in this environment before. So when we start worship or praise and worship, mm. the first note, the presence of the Lord falls on all the camp mm. and everyone starts speaking in tongues. But here's the thing. They were all speaking different languages. They weren't just speaking heavenly tongue. The, the, the kid that I friended that was from the Midwest, a white boy, a farm boy, I, you know, he knew no, he was speaking perfect dialogue of Spanish saying how much he loves God and how much he's worthy. And at that time, when, you know, 12 years old and I'm looking around and I'm like, I've never seen this before. Wow. God's really touching us. And I remember standing on my chair and just yelling, yes, Lord, yes, whatever this is, yes. And I remember my friend trying to pull me down because he was embarrassed. And I was just overwhelmed because I was like, this is, this is special. This is God. This is God loving us. And I'm like, yes. And, and I, I believe that's when I was called to full-time ministry. That's, that's the moment I feel like 
at 12 years old, even though I, I backslid and became a prodigal, I feel like at that time that marked me uh, for eternity. And, and, and in a sense, I was always going to be looking for his presence. I was always going to be looking for spirit, being spirit filled and going after whatever the Lord said we have access to in his presence and being filled with the Holy Spirit. I knew I was going to go after it because it was the real deal. Oh, that's powerful. That's powerful. Um, I know you're, you, you mentoring inner city kids, um, mm -hmm. and you even mentoring, um, some of the worst drug dealers, you know, mm -hmm. um, can you talk about some of that work? What are you exactly doing? You know, well, talk a little bit about that. Right now, right now, uh, I work in some of the biggest public school system, uh, uh, public high schools that have a lot of inner city, a lot of crime, a lot of things going on. I, I, I did resign from them, but um, I, I continually right now with our church right now, we are in because of the bridges I've made into the inner city. Um, we have invited a bunch of them to come out to our revival services because we want we want them to accept Jesus and to 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 know what it's like to have peace. But for years, I mentored uh uh, gang, drug dealers, uh, young ladies in sex trafficking. I, mm -hmm. I did it through a nonprofit of the YMCA here in our city, mm -hmm. but I also connected and built a bridge to the church. And so a lot of, uh, and then I also had kids that I, I mentored and fathered and they brought drug dealers <laughs> to our youth group and stuff. And so we, we, you know, my heart is, I really have a heart for inner city and the number one thing, the number one problem of inner city is a lack of fathers. Mm. And I wonder, I wonder if we were to take Paul's example. Paul didn't have kids of his own, but he had spiritual kid in Timothy, Titus, and, you know, o Onesis. I mean, he had spiritual kids. And when it says in Habakkuk, like, you know, fathers turn your hearts to your children and children turn to your fathers. If you enjoy our contents, be sure to like, share, and subscribe to stay up to date with our latest releases. Turn on the notification bell. Have a story to tell? We'd love to hear it. Reach out to us at cindybingham.com or connect with us on Instagram. Now, back to the show. I really feel like this is the hour where the church needs to be these fathers and mothers to the fatherless. You know, God promised us he wouldn't leave us as orphans and through salvation and through sonship, we can experience adoption in him. But I also think in this hour, it's so critical that the church activates this heart to want to adopt these guys that are broken. Uh, let me give you, let me just give you an example. My, mm -hmm. um, remember when I told you I walked in the church and my buddy, Mike, that guy, Mike, he ended up being a brother. Well, he, um, he's an African American guy. He, he, he's still my, my brother of another. Like we, we just, we just think of each other as that close. His mother became my spiritual mother. Wow. She became my spiritual mama. And one of the things that happened when, um, when I got kicked out of my house, cause I was serving the Lord and, and <laughs> my mother kicked me out because she was going through depression. And I remember going to her and she didn't like that. I didn't accept one of her boyfriends. And I said, mom, he's not dad. And the Lord told me that you and dad were going to get back together. Well, she got really angry. She kicked me out. <laughs> <laughs> maybe maybe I could have been a little more sensitive. I don't know. But when that happened, my spiritual mama, she she let me in her house. She had a very uh, a, a bigger house. And um, and she told me, Chris, two things. If you live here, I don't want you to pay rent, but I want you to be at church every Sunday. And I want you to be at family dinner every Sunday night. Wow. And as an orphan guy that was still dealing with his orphan spirit. Those boundaries actually showed me the heart of God because being consistent in church helped me to learn how to battle for my family, being in community, being involved, having friends that were going to pray for you, having teachings and preachings and corporate worship and praise and conferences. All that stuff was necessary for me to learn how to fight for my family. 
you know, in the spirit. And then she would teach me. I, I, then on Sunday nights, I would go to her table and she would create these. And, and, and you know, she's Southern. She's Southern black. You know, she's from Georgia, <laughs> you know, and they cook all. As soon as she got home from church, they were cooking. And it wasn't it wasn't. A, oh, let's just order a pizza. It was collard greens. It was fried chicken. It was chick. It was dumplings. It was mac and cheese. It was and and, and, and it was a spread. And they and they would put so much love in it, and and she would and in that time we would learn as a I learned as a family to sit at a table is important to make a meal to host your family with, right? These weren't guests, and there was something about the Holy Spirit that would just touch me and say, "This is what I want in my family." That's why the Bible says, "Practice hospitality." There's an anointing in hospitality. And, and if you practice hospitality you're, you're in your home, your home will be a mission field for those that don't have never felt appreciated or have been broken or outcast, you know. And, and, and so that's one thing that I always take away. It taught me. And so for me, we, we've, we, we, we um, in ministry for years, we opened up our home. We had these guys come. You all need, you guys come from broken situations. You need to see wholeness. My wife and I, we were both virgins when we got married, right? <laughs> That's something you don't hear of right, right now, right? Wow. We both, and, and we both, we both wanted to be an example and needed to show how a husband treats his wife, how a wife treats his husband, and how a father treats his kids, how a mother, you know, and so our, our, the guys we mentored had a first row seat on how functional family was. Wow. And, and, and I feel like that is exactly what we need to do. That's discipleship. That's you know, right. there has to be discipleship in the word, but there's also life discipleship. Let me teach you guys like Jesus, right? Jesus had to, they had, he had, he had to love these guys and they had to make them belong in his love before they believed. Right. That's right. And, and after they believed they behaved. And we need to be people that, like, people, when they gather around us, they want to belong in what we're doing. They don't necessarily know how to behave. Mm. But when they start to believe in what, what, you, what we're unifying, and that's under the power of the Holy Spirit in oneness, right? Then they start to behave. A lot of times we give a message out there that you have to clean yourself and be the best version of who you are before you can get into the courts of, 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 of heaven, <laughs> before you can get in the presence of the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit, and Jesus says, I came for the weak. I didn't come for the strong. <laughs> you know, it's like I tell, I tell my friends, you know, I, you know, I have friends that are like, oh, I got to get my life right before I could go to church. And I'm like, well, let me ask you something. Do you go to the doctors when you're healthy? And he goes, no, I go when I'm sick. Mm. Yeah. I said, well, that makes sense. Because now, how are you going to know if your doctor's good if the only times you show up, if you're healthy? How are you going to know that Jesus loves you with love and kindness that leads you to repentance if you don't come broken? Mm. You know? And so for, 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 uh, for me, that's what transformed my life uh, and, and my wife's life. And we've seen, we seen fruit of it. Just we have amazing spiritual sons and daughters that are doing amazing things all over, not only the D.C., Maryland and Virginia side, but all over the United States. And we had just and, and we just had a little bit of a, a, of a say or a direction or, or a God given prophetic word in that life to be able to see that. But that's what it's all about for yes. us. It, fa family is the governments of heaven. <laughs> right. If, 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 if it wasn't, then why did God send a son? He sent a son. Mm. He didn't send four living creatures or the, the, the angel Gabriel. He sent a son because he sends his son to an orphan planet to reveal the father. That's right. Family then has to be something that, 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 chain, that, that, that is touched by God and that we are living in the overflow of his presence at home. That's and right. then we come together corporately, right? That's right. 
But we te- but but Western churches we, we we treat treat them more like orphanage or gas stations. Lord, fill me up, fill me up, and then 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 the expression of God in your life is all about you getting blessed, and it's not about you being a blessing already and cultivating these things and learning that there's a convergence in the spirit that happens when brothers get together, and how yeah. beautiful it is when we dwell together in unity, and it's like the oil that pours from the top down, and if we want more oil in our lives, then unity is necessary. Then that means our homes need to be our first sanctuaries. Wow. I'm sorry. You touched on a subject I love. This is powerful. (laughs) This is I can see that you're passionate about it and I want to hear more. This is powerful, Pastor. Yeah. So that's why that's why for us, you know, again, and I'm not saying we don't need church. We need church. Mm. We need the church. We, we, we need these buildings filled of his presence, filled with the loss, but we have gotten stagnant in, in, in our nation because we no longer are trying to go after the loss. Now it's all become corporate and what I can get out of it. So, so church growth really is only disgruntled believers leaving one church and joining another church. And, and then if they get offended there, then they just go to another church. So they are constantly having a honeymoon season with churches, but they never learn how to put some roots somewhere and help build a vision. Mm. You know, how can pastors, how can pastors trust uh, believers if all they do is leave when they're first offended, you know? <laughs> That's right. And so, and so it's been this whole thing of like, we got to get back to the great commission that Jesus gave us. We got to get back to unifying churches because he's coming for a unified bride. That's right. And so to me, it's just to me in my life, uh, I've just seen the, the, the presence of the Lord. We raised our four kids and we believe now my kids. Are, are, are still walking out their faith and they're going through things and we're proud of them. Mm. But we raised our kids in the presence of God. In the presence of God. Amen. Can I give you one testimony? Yes. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> so, so I want to let you know, when, when my son was five years old, mm. um, I, 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 I was a youth pastor. And me and my spiritual father, we would take the youth and we would rent beach houses in uh, the Outer Banks. And what we would do is we'd take the young people there. And in the morning, we'd have a session. And the morning session was all about why we believe in the Holy Spirit. We would mm. teach scriptures on why are we spirit filled, the importance of the Holy Spirit in our life. And in the evening, what we read in the scriptures, we would encounter. <laughs> and and sure enough, after three years of doing this, uh, we ended up having to get two beach homes because we had so many young people that we were bringing. And then we also had a worship team that we were raising up, a youth worship team. And these kids were being just just possessed by the Holy Spirit. And they were writing these beautiful songs. And and so we had the beginnings of this worship team. And so we knew we can't bring our worship team into a house and and and, and have a have a worship service because we'll disturb the neighborhood. So that's that summer I called what I thought were spirit filled churches. And the first church I called was an Assemblies of God church. And I was like, yeah, they're spirit filled. And I called and the youth pastor picked up and I asked him, can we rent uh, your youth room Monday through Fridays in the evening so that we could bring our worship team so they could, so that we could have our evening services? Cause we had about 65 young people. Wow. And he goes, man, I can't rent. I can't charge you guys rent. Hey, why don't we do this? Why don't you I, I you come Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday for free. Wednesday night is our youth night. Why don't you preach and you bring your worship team and you guys do worship for us? And I said, okay, deal. My wife was at home with my two boys. My wife was pregnant with our third son, so she couldn't come. Um, and she was like seven months pregnant. Um, and uh, and so so. All of a sudden, we do sound check that Wednesday. And Miss Cindy, I tell you, the room looked like it was getting foggy. <laughs> and I said, what's going on here? And so I, I was like, hey, can we look for the smoke machine? Someone turned on the smoke machine. And there was like a cloud appearing. And I said, man, it's really musky. Like you can't really see, you know, and, and it's hazy, right? 
And so I called the youth pastor up. I said, hey, hey, buddy. Oh, by the way, when I called the youth pastor to ask to rent the room, it was his first day as youth pastor. <laughs> God's so good. And so wow. I called I called the youth pastor. And I go, where's your smoke machine? And he goes, oh, brother, we don't have a smoke machine. And I go, oh, oh, wow, that's weird. As soon as I hung up, two of my spiritual sons come and they said, hey, I found a ruby and a diamond on the floor. My God, my God. And I said, I said, this is weird. So I called him back and I called the youth pastor back. and I said, hey, hey, brother, I, we found that missing diamond and that missing ruby that you guys lost. And he goes, hey, he, he's a surfer guy, right? Because he lives in the Outer Banks and in the beach, right? And he goes, hey, dude, uh, we're young. We're youth. We don't have diamonds and rubies. And I was like, wow, what's going on, Lord? What are you doing? Mm -hmm. So we continue to sound check. Sure enough, one of our young people run into the building and says, hey, the kids are lining up. To be, the parents are dropping off the kids. But as soon as the kids hit the, hit the, hit the parking lot, they get slain in the spirit. And I was like, what? So we had to go out and pick up the kids that are falling out in the spirit before service starts to bring them into service. At that point, the parents are like, the Holy Spirit is here. We're going to park. And they joined us for the service. So now it's that. All of a sudden, I mean, and you could feel faith rising up. The presence of God is overwhelming us. I'm like, Jesus, what is going on? And, and all of a sudden we see a young lady come into the service and she was, she was sad. She was in crutches and she had a, a soft cast from her hip to her foot. And my spiritual son, uh, Sean, he comes up to me and he says, Hey, let's go pray for her. That's right. And I said, okay, let, let's go pray for her. Well, I mean, we already had rubies, diamonds. There's a cloud in here, people falling out. We might as well just go pray. And I just want, I mean, and I thought we were just praying to bless her. I had no faith for healing. <laughs> so when I go and <laughs> I, I went, when Sean goes and asks her, hey, what happened? She basically says, I am the star soccer player of my team. It's my senior year. And two weeks ago, I got hit by a car and broke both bones mm -hmm. on my leg. Mm -hmm. She said, they, she said, I have a rod from my hip to my ankle. And then she, you know, she, she showed us with, cause she had a soft cast. She showed us where the nuts and bolts were around her knees. Mm. And so we felt it and we could feel that there were nuts and bolts. And, and so Sean, he looks at her and goes, Hey, we're going to pray that Jesus heals you. And I look at Sean and I'm like, Oh, is that what we're doing? <laughs> and I was just kind of like, Oh Lord, what's happening. But at the same time, my hand gets really hot and I'm like, wow, that's weird. I've never had that happen. And so Sean and I put our hands on her and my hand starts to get really, really hot. And I start, and I start to, I start to feel the nuts and bolts dissolve. My God. And Sean, and I'm looking at Sean and he's like, my hand is hot. And, 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 and we're sweating because it's so hot. And all of a sudden the young girl screams, Ah, my leg is burning up and she starts jumping up and down. She rips her soft cast out and she starts dancing and she's completely healed. Now, now I am in shock Pretty and bad. you know, and Sean, he, he's like, he's like, he knew God was going to do it. Right. I'm like, huh, my Lord. So I, this is my first tangible miracle that I've seen where I could, I've, you know, I could like say like, Lord, this was supernatural I go and call my wife. My wife, I, I call her and I go, Bethany. She goes, Chris. I go, Bethany. She goes, Chris. And I was like, what? She was like, I got something to tell you. And I was like, baby, I got something to tell you. You're not going to believe this. She goes, but I, but I have something to tell you. You're not going to believe this. And, 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 and then she goes, she goes, um, you, and I was like, it's about Josiah, my son, who's five years old. And I go, okay, what happened to Josiah? She goes, Josiah was in his playroom. And I was cooking dinner and I was noticing that he came out of the playroom and he sat on the couch. And I was like, okay. She goes, Chris, when I asked him 20 minutes later, what happened? This is what Josiah said to me. She goes, mom, mommy, um, 
uh, I was watching Little Einstein on my little TV in my playroom, and Jesus walked into my playroom, and he said, turn off Little Einstein and go to the couch in the living room. I want to take you to heaven. And so, Mommy, I turned off Einstein, and I sat on the couch, and Jesus took me to heaven, and I saw Daddy and Uncle Sean take a stick out of a girl's leg. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. Woo! And, and Miss Cindy, at that point, I was like, and then my wife goes, what did you want to tell me? And I go, baby, that's exactly what just happened. That's at that time, I knew that it is capable for young little ones, because there's no junior Holy Spirit, for them to go to heaven, for them to have downloads. And we just got to, as parents, cultivate an atmosphere where we're actually inviting them into the family encounter with Holy Spirit. Again, everything is from the home. And so we saw this. My son went to heaven like four or five times by the, by the time he was a teenager. You know, and, 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 and we're sitting here and we're saying, okay, this is possible. This is possible. We want to raise revivalists. And so in our hearts, this is why we, we, we believe in the home. We believe in, in the power of the Holy Spirit. We believe there's no junior Holy Spirit. We believe that the outcast in society needs a love encounter with Jesus. And we're going to go after that for the rest of our lives. Because at some point, these guys are going to be the next generals of our faith and the next generation that is marked in his presence. I don't want to continue to just hear the bad news of what the enemy's doing. There is a remnant and there is a response from heaven for what the enemy's been boasting in for the last four years. And I want to be part of the response. Ooh. You know? Wow. Pastor Chris. <laughs> wow. That was powerful that was powerful um pastor chris you went through a period where you felt abandoned right you felt mm -hmm. abandoned um you fall into depression um you felt like god wasn't there for you guys or for your family mm -hmm. because your parents were separated well you know for those who, who are watching and those who believe in god but may have may not have fully surrendered their lives to him, you know, what words of encouragement, you know, maybe they're in the same situation that you were. Yeah. What words of encouragement do you have for him? I, I'm going to say this, try everything, mm. try everything, try inner healing, try therapy, try deliverance, try medication. If you need to for, for a season under a, a psychiatrist, try, try everything. Go up for prayer. Don't quit. Be persistent. Ask, seek, and knock is a continuum. Ask God, uh, the, you know, um, and then knock <laughs> until the doors open. Seek until okay. you find. We have to have grit right now. And I can tell you there were times that I was, I, 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 I was in a fog. Um, uh, to be honest, I think my family has a lack of, of lithium in our brain. And, and that's not a demon. You know, mm. I, I did everything, though. I wanted to make sure if I had a demon, then I was going to get delivered. Amen. I, I, I needed inner healing. Then I was going to do that. But there were times where I needed a little medicine. Because my families was watching, my sons and my daughters were watching me be this superhero on Sunday. But on Monday, just being depressed and staying in the, in the bedroom till 6 p.m. I couldn't afford to let them see that. I was going to do everything. I wish I took medicine earlier. I was too prideful. And I, and I, I felt like I, if I took medicine, that I wouldn't believe that God could heal me. No, yeah. he, he uses medicine. If you have cancer, he uses radiation. Yes, radiation can also kill you i know there's a balance if you have a headache you pray but then take some advil you know it's like we 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 we, we can't god it god can you i mean there's a reason why luke was his disciple he was a physician That's right. <laughs> you know 
<laughs> right? If you know, and so 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 I say do everything that you can. It is scary. I am ministering to people all over the world in my DMs and in my Facebook messengers that have seen my testimony that can't take their medicine because they feel like because people have told them that they are uh they are demon possessed and not mentally uh challenged or ill. I'm saying, listen, man, just try everything and then try it again and don't quit. But make sure you bring friend. you know, you tell your pastors, tell your mentors, call the intercessors, let them anoint you with oil, do everything you can. And I'm telling you, for me, it was a spiritual attack that the enemy was trying to do in my life to get me to agree with generational curses that I broke a long time ago. And honestly, right now, I, I just I, I, I know that a lot of faith guys would disagree with me. And I can only tell you what's worked for my family. I don't believe <laughs> I don't believe that I am possessed by a, a, a mental infirmity or whatever. I, I, I still get deliverance. I still go for deliverance. I still have inner healing. I still go to therapy when I need to. Listen, caring the, 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 you know, pastoring people, you got to be careful that some of that stuff doesn't transfer in your own life. So you mm. better check yourself. You know, it's like, it's like getting an oil change, right? <laughs> right. right. And so I'm, I'm big on all those things, but there are times that, you know, I'm up praying and, and honestly, I'm, I'm starting to get anxious and, and I'll take a melatonin to go to bed because <laughs> I need to sleep. You know, but but I, I would say my encouragement for everyone is it's not a lack of faith. It's not. Mm. And I wish the church was a little more sensitive and not think making everything demons. Now, there are demons that operate in that way. Yes. But we have to be discerning. We have to know, is this our identity or is this a spiritual attack? And mm. sometimes we, we sometimes we need strength. You need to take that pill to, to go to bed because you need strength to pray the next day. And so Jesus is compassionate and he's understanding. But something that happened to me, um, I was given um, an antidepressant when I was in a season of really going through some hardship, uh, uh, you know, just some church stuff, politics, all this stuff. And, um, and, uh, and it was on my dresser for like two or three months, I believe. And every morning I refused to take it because I said, Jesus is going to heal me. And, and, and for three or two months, I did that. Finally, I prayed one morning and I saw Jesus walk into my room and he gave me the pill and said, just take it, son. It's not forever. Yeah. And that was the first time I took it. And I can tell you this much. My wife is a benefit benefactor of it. My kids are because I've learned to level out. Um, and, and again, I, I, I wish I would have done it earlier, but I, I learned. And so what I'm learning, I want to pass on that wisdom to a lot of it, because sometimes we can get so engulfed in the call of God and in the momentum of revival that all of a sudden we, we lose the boundaries of having time for ourselves. You know, for instance, when, 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 when uh, Jesus was in Capernaum, you know, and he heals, he heals uh, Peter's mother-in-law and, um, and he, and, and revival breaks out in Capernaum. Right. Mm -hmm. And, you know, he's, he's, he's teaching all night and he goes, they go, they go to bed and, and all of a sudden he wakes up early and it says he wakes up when the sun isn't even out to go connect with the father. Right. Nothing was going to take away from Jesus's intimacy with the father. Mm. And even then the disciples came and said, the people are so hungry because revival hit Capernaum and they need you to go and, and they want you to come and minister. And he said, I didn't come to Capernaum to bring revival. And he says, and Jesus teaches us to say no to the good thing because he said yes to the cross. That's powerful. And we need to learn to say no to good things in church and say yes to our family and yes to the one thing that God's placed in our heart. There's a lot of great activities, but God is going to raise up harvest workers, right? And yes, the workers are few and the harvest is plentiful, but we can't lose our families. This is where a lot of my spiritual fathers just basically were engulfed in their ministry so much that their kids weren't focused on and they became wayward. 
You know, there, there was divorces happening. I am not going to put my kids on the altars of revival, right? And lose them, but gain a nation. Cool. No, I'm, I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to marry both of them as best as I can, but I'm going to make sure I'm there for my kids. Cause that is my first responsibility. My wife is my first ministry. And so those kind of things is, it, are the things that kind of just stir me, you know, and, 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 and I'm seeing Miss Cindy, I'm seeing churches really start to get a grasp of it. And it's exciting right now. We could concentrate on all the bad stuff that's happening in every ministry that's being revealed in idolatry and fornication and all that. But inside of all of that, God has awoken a remnant of, of sons and daughters that had a little perseverance, a little grit. And we're saying we are going to be the response of heaven in this dark hour in the history of this nation. Powerful, powerful. Uh, Pastor, how would you describe your personal relationship with Jesus? <laughs> you know, it's interesting. I, I used to read books about Smith Wigglesworth. And uh, I, I love reading about Smith Wigglesworth. And it said, man, he would stop maybe every, what, 15 minutes to read the Bible. He would pray continual. I, I would say this, me and, me and Jesus talk all the time. We talk all the time. I, 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 I'm asking him questions. I'm praying. When, and, and so I, I, I would say I wish I had, I wish I could get three hours and just spend time with the father. But I kind of enjoy doing life with him and in the car ride, worshiping him and in, in asking him things and praying. Um, I'm constantly just dreaming about revival. You know what I'm saying? And so my relationship is one where I love worshiping him. I love being by myself with the Father and just praising Him and thanking Him. And then I'm constantly remembering my testimony, my first love. And so my relationship is one where I do a lot of conversating. Uh, people say it's prayer. It could be prayer. But also I'm learning to abide. I'm learning to be comfortable next to the presence of God where I don't need a sermon to preach. Right? Or I don't, I, I don't, you know, I, I just need to be, you know, it, 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 having my own kids, there's sometimes I have one of my sons, he, anytime the presence of the room, presence falls in a room where we're worshiping or where there's a service, my son just sticks close to me and he's just there. And I'm watching my son in the presence of God and I'm saying, wow, he, He's just comfortable around me. I just want to be comfortable around the presence of God. And if there's something in me that needs to get corrected, then correct me, Lord. <laughs> I have a history where you've been so good. And, and, and again, a lot of us, we love Jesus as love, but Jesus is also the truth. And it's the truth that sets us free. And, and, and so, uh, so me, I'm learning to continue to abide. I'm learning to worship him with everything that I have. Um, I, I, you know, but, but, uh, I, I'm learning to be comfortable just being and having his gaze on me, you know? Ooh, Pastor Chris, <laughs> this is powerful. This is powerful. Thank I have you a so last question. My last question is, um, you've given your testimony over and over several times, mm -hmm. but what do you hope listeners take away from your testimony today? Daniel eleven thirty two. 32, the people mm. that know their God will do great exploits. I am, <laughs> I want to get, I grew up poor, dyslexic. Mm. I had a stuttering problem with public speaking, dysgraphia, ADHD, and the Holy Spirit touched me and I'm just hungry and I'm hungrier. And the only thing I could tell you is I'm a normal guy that's just hungry. And, and it's not about competition who eats more of God. I just want to be in the room and, 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 and inspire people to go after God in hunger and see heavenly results. That, that's, that's, that's who I am. I, I am a revivalist. I, I've come to terms with that. I want to see us change a nation. I want to see the things that the Bible inspired us to go after, like Nineveh. 
You know, I, 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 you know, if we're to do greater things than Jesus, then come on, let's do greater things than Jesus. He gave us permission to do that as co-heirs in his kingdom. So I would say that that's, that's who I am. I'm just, I'm, I'm not satisfied. And I, I, I love, I love how God's working. And, and, and at 47 years old, I'm finally getting it. <laughs> Pastor Chris, this was, wow. I, I did not expect this podcast to go this way, but again, you know, the Holy Spirit just took over and, you know, you, you really ministered, you ministered to me and, uh, and you, you, you know, this is going to go out to thousands of people and Amen. people are going to be blessed. People are going to be blessed. Amen. We need revival Amen. starting from our homes. I love yes. that. We're starting revival at home and we're bringing it to church, you know? Amen. So, um, Pastor, I just want to thank you from the bottom of my heart for taking the time to come out and, you know, just sit on our platform and share your powerful, powerful testimony and just ministering Amen. to us. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs>